Great. Um, so yeah, so first of all, I'd just like to extend a huge thanks to Hanale and all the people in the Interact team for making this all possible. Um, and all the station managers, the logistics teams and all the other scientists. So you, you've really made this such a, a fantastic experience. So just as a bit of an overview of, of where the talk will go. Where not a glacial specialist or a geomorphologist. Um, so I'll give a bit of an introduction as to why we would want to study glacial meltwater and glacial systems more generally and then move into the, the kind of story of, of our field work that we've been doing, the analysis that is ongoing at the moment um, and some kind of thoughts and how this might key into to other parts of Arctic and glacial science more generally as well. Okay, so why, why on earth would we want to go and look at glacial meltwater rivers first of all? Um, so I guess as uh, earth, sciences, earth scientists, we're, we're all quite familiar with this idea that we have unprecedented air temperature rise and the Arctic in particular is really feeling the, um, the, the results of this. Um, so this is just um, a graph on the right hand side here of Greenland surface melt extent over the years. So 1981 to 2010 median is in grey um, down at the bottom there um, and then we move through the years up until 2019 because that's the kind of last full data set that, that we have available. Um, what we can see or, or what the general gist that I'd like you to take from this is really that over time we've seen an increase um, in the melt area but also an increase in the time in which we have that melt going on in Greenland. So this is the ice sheet per se. I'll be talking about ice caps and smaller glaciers a little bit later. But the idea is the same. What we're seeing is often prolonged melt seasons and more melt as well. Um, so real impacts there on, on the cryospheric systems in the Arctic. And just to kind of pull this into to one of the interact sites here, this is very simply plotted um, discharge data from Zackenberg and I've just pulled out a few different um, data points here. For anyone who works at Zackenberg you will know that their data sets are phenomenally detailed, they're absolutely amazing. Um, so I've really simplified this down here. So this is month at the bottom um, going from April to November. So 1996 river discharge there is in green. Um, so relatively low in comparison to the rest of the years and as we move up to 2012 2016 we can see much higher discharge and we can start to see that encroachment on a, a much longer melt season as well what we are seeing as well in some of these systems is that the melt season starts a little bit earlier um, and we can see those much larger peaks coming through the system and um, increased flood events and, and that kind of thing as well so what we're seeing is overall increase in melt so how does that affect rivers and how does that key into the kind of work that we've been doing then? So as we have glaciers starting to recede, so this enhanced air temperature, increased air temperature is causing increased glacier mass loss and more of this melt. As the glacier starts to pull back, we see this exposed fall and just kind of unveiling all of this glacially prepared sediment um, right before our eyes, basically. And a lot of that material is unconsolidated so it's just as you can see in the picture here this is right at the um, at the margins of the ice up at uh, Villem Station Nord in North Greenland it's kind of very what we would call labile it's very susceptible to being moved around quite readily and there are a lot of other processes going on here as well we've got the glacial meltwater input which then leads to, to river erosion into some of this sediment we start to see things like mass movement um, soil formation will start to creep in as well so I know a lot of people are working on the biological component in these fallens and as the ice moves away those kind of biological processes start to take their place if you like. We're also seeing permafrost thaw in a lot of these catchments as well so a lot of the things that we've been thinking about is how how does the river discharge interact with some of these permafrost catchments as well. So we're very much in these glacial systems in this this period of geomorphological transition and if you are thinking of this from a, a much longer term perspective which often I do so I come I come at a lot of my research from a, a quaternary science perspective rather than a modern day perspective we would start to think of this in terms of paraglacial processes so that much more prolonged period of of transition in the proglacial um, realm 
So if we were to just put this into a kind of schematic diagram here, so this is a picture um, from Disco Island, so I'll come back to this site, but I've used it as a bit of a, a kind of poster boy example here. So this is one example of a catch where we've got the ice mass over on the right hand side, that's putting things like meltwater and sediment into the rest of the basin. We've got often steep sided slopes susceptible to mass movement. So as the ice starts to, to retreat, it can thin to so down waste as well as retreating back on itself. It exposes these um, valley sides to a lot of mass movement as they become destabilized. We then also have erosion and deposition as we move downstream in those river systems. We have sediment being stored and then re-released. We've got thaw of the permafrost much further down in the catchment as well. We can have soil formation, albeit quite thin sometimes, and thin vegetation um, veils developing on the landscape. In some systems, we also have outburst floods and they can quite considerably transform uh, this pro-glacial environment. So there's a lot going on here. It's, it's kind of process wise, it's quite messy. And these are just some of the processes going on. I know a lot of people are working on all kinds of different lenses in these different systems and different ways of thinking about these processes. So there is a lot going on. Um, and what we're trying to think about is how do we unravel those and how do we understand how things actually move through the system? So why does that even matter? So why on earth would we want to kind of unravel this, this puzzle? So I guess if we think about the present day, we've got a lot of these glacials, glacial systems and glaciers sat within permafrost catchments, so they drain through permafrost catchments. And they contain a lot of organic carbon. Some estimates, these are kind of changed quite a lot over time, um, but twice the global atmosphere is freeze locked in these, these permafrost layers. And as we're seeing um, increased thaw depth in a lot of these catchments, that then becomes susceptible to erosion and transport further downstream. So that might be a major driver of release of some of this freeze locked organic carbon. We also know that there are some studies going on um, in the Arctic and, and other alpine catchments where we might have things like pollutants being flushed through the system with higher discharge. We can have um, other minerals being transported downstream and then subsequently offshore. And a lot of these mineralogenic grains, so things like silt and clay, sand and so on, they're the perfect vehicle to move these um, minerals, these pollutants and this carbon further downstream. So this is just a picture here uh, from Disco Island again, kind of right before the river meets the ocean, basically, we can see some little um, icebergs in the background there. So from a, a modern day perspective, understanding the processes operating in these systems is important if we then want to understand all the other processes that are going on, um, terrestrial um, ecosystems, for example, marine ecosystems, and so on and so forth. From my own kind of perspective and my own um, way of, of coming into this is really to think about the past and so we don't often have access to a time machine typically so as quaternary scientists or, or anybody wanting to understand the longer term uh, processes and un understand those environmental shifts in more detail we rely often on sedimentary sequences to do this so these are just some photos on the right hand side um, from my PhD student here, Matt Carney, who's there in the red jacket. Um, so he doesn't work in the Arctic, he's working on um, proglacial lake sediments at the margins of what was the former British Irish ice sheet. So these are some of his um, really beautiful sediments there. Um, and he's reconstructing, he's doing a lot of work reconstructing um, how we can use the mineral signatures of those, the carbon signatures and so on to understand what the big ice sheet is doing. This is not his DeLorean, I will add, he doesn't have a DeLorean at all. Um, but the thing is, what we want to understand is, if we have these um, processes going on as we move from the ice margin to, for example, a proglacial lake or a depositional centre, where we would then go and analyse these sedimentary archives, we really need to understand the processes between those. We want to join the dots and we want to understand how are these sediments transformed as they make their way from the ice to what will eventually be the lake sediment record or the fluvial record that we go and analyze much further down the line. So to do that, our work really with Interact got into looking at what are those modern day processes and how can we really get a handle on those going to modern day ice margins. So that's where this really kind of fits in, um, I suppose. Okay, so I'll 
kind of briefly talk about how we go about doing this, where we've been working and the state of play with some of this analysis. And then um, I'll just give you a brief update on where we're up to and show some graphs and things like that. And we'll see what we've got. OK, so the key questions then that have come out of this. So how are meltwater rivers changing over time and over space? How does that influence landscape evolution on a, a modern day scale, but then certainly over a much longer time period as well? And how does that all influence this idea of a sediment cascade as we go from the ice margin further downstream, whether that's to a lake or ultimately offshore? So what are those processes going on? How does the, the sediment get transformed during that process? We can think about things like sources and sinks. So are sediments stored temporarily within the catchment before they're then re-released? How does that then influence things like carbon storage and release downstream? Can we identify any Greenland wide or catchment wide or even in stream variations within this? Um, and how can that then inform what we know about geochemical um, transformations further downstream? So via Interact, we've been really lucky. We've been able to, to, to look at these systems in Disco, uh, in Zackenberg and up at Station Nord or Villem. Um, in the north of Greenland. So today I'll focus on Disco and uh, Willem, mainly because a lot of my stuff from Zackenberg is currently being held captive in the science block in my office um, because we won't be allowed access to this until I think September. So there are still some samples that have just been analysed, hard drives, things like that, that I just don't have access to right now, which is a shame. Um, but given that we've only got half an hour, um, there's plenty to talk about with these other two sites. So um, more will be forthcoming, um, so we'll focus on two for today. So just to, to give you an idea of how we go about this, I'm sure a lot of you have worked in other interact stations before as well, um, maybe even Billum and Antarctic Station. Um, so this is what these two look like, um, both amazing places to stay, brilliant teams, and it's always like going back to a second home when you go back to these places, they're just, they're just really wonderful. So usually there are, there are two of us who go out. Um, it's basically quite a simple job of just scooping up sand, filtering some water and so on. So it's not, um, not that uh, technically demanding, actually. I call it kind of bucket and spade science because it is usually just us with the buckets and pots and a spade. Um, so we load up our bags. We often go on quite long walks up to the ice margin um, through the river systems and um, we camp. Um, so often amazing views, northern lights and all those kind of things. It's just always a really, really fun time. Um, so we've been working here over the last couple of years on and off between these two sites and Zackenberg and interspersing that with other projects as well. Um, so Tim Lane, who I, who I do a lot of the field work with, he always laughs at me because I'm always the one there with a spade kind of hopping into the river to grab more samples and things like that. Um, my ethos in life is you can never really have enough sand because you're always going to analyse it at some point later. And this is what we do. So this is typically what the whole thing looks like. Um, it's normally um, Tim and I crouched at the side of a river or within the river and um, taking some samples from the bed, from the bank, sometimes from river terraces, moraines and things like that. Um, we store these in often just little bags or sometimes we wrap them up in little uh, decarbonized foil parcels if we want to look at the carbon content. So it's just like um, wrapping lots of mini burritos over and over and over. We eventually ship them back um, and they're often put in pots or however we want to analyze them. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the lab. I've got a lot of amazing students who are just very patient and they process this and they help with the, the interpretation. So yeah, it's, it's a fun process, lots of really nice field work you can really get to grips with. Um, the landscape basically and you can really start to understand how complex these processes actually are. So once we've, we've put everything in our little pots, an idea of the kind of things that we're measuring on these. Um, first of all we want to look at what is the depositional setting, so if, if we're trying to analyse how this sediment is moved downstream and stored and remobilised and so on, we want to think about what is the river doing? What's the actual, um, what we call the plan form of that river? What does it look like? Are there any sediment um, bars? Are there any um, inc incisions into the banks and so on? We then want to think about what's the distance downstream? Are there any spatial patterns that we can identify? So a lot of this is also using um, 
the excellent Arctic DM, even things like Google Earth, and I've used some of those images here um, later down the line, um, just to have a look at what the rivers are doing and what they have been doing over time. In the lab, we want to think about things like what is the elemental composition? So I've mentioned different um, minerals, different elements. So typically we'll use XRF, often we'll support that with XRD, so X-ray fluorescence and X-ray diffraction, so that we can really get to grips with what these sediments are actually made of. And often it's, it's typically the material that the glacier has ripped out of the bedrock and pulverized into a, a silty sand kind of material and then transported downstream. So we can start to see, once we've got that end member of what the glacier is taking out of the bedrock, we can start to see how that's transformed as we move downstream. We also want to think about the grain size. So are we talking about quite large particles? Is it, is it dominantly pebbles or bigger? Or have we got things more down the silt and clay end of the spectrum? There's a lot of work done on um, whether carbon is preferentially transported and stored in the smaller size fractions. So if we have a lot of clay present, do we have a lot more carbon? And are certain elements um, shown to have an affinity to certain grain sizes as well as they go through this erosion process downstream? We also want to think about um, what's the organic content like, what's the carbon, where is that coming from as well? So if we're saying that the, as the glacier starts to retreat, and biological processes start to take hold, can we start to track that and can we see areas where there is a much higher preference for some of this organic material um, to be growing and stored and so on in, in the environment. So a whole lot of different analyses here, um, so it takes quite a long time if we, if we have individual samples that have to go through a lot of different processes. So I'll just um, spend the rest of the time, I'll just do a little time check on myself. Um, spend the rest of the time talking through what we've got so far from these different sites and then obviously really happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll try not to do death by graph, which is often the case sometimes when you've got a lot of these, these data sets. So we'll just kind of go through it and I'll pull out what the key ideas are. So here, uh, this, this glacier margin here is Flood Isplink up in the north of Greenland relatively shallow gradient catchment actually so again because i don't have access to anything fancy at, at work at the moment this is just a quite an effective actually um google earth profile here so it's, it's relatively shallow gradient we don't see any big surprises as we move downstream this ice margin is quite amazing it's so straight and you can just stand at one place and you can look straight down it i absolutely love it i think it's beautiful um and it's just a river that's basically just finding its way and starting to incise in this huge sheet of sediment which is probably a little bit glacial till, some alluvium and so on, and very limited vegetation development. So just to give you an idea of some of the, the, the kind of views that we see here. So this is right up at the ice margin here, that's Tim Lane for scale, so you can see how big that is, that's just like a snow drape on the, on the margin of the ice there. The water here is pretty unconfined, um, it's kind of just trying to find its way and as we move downstream it starts to carve itself a channel and it's quite happy there. As we move downstream we then see some bar development and um, we start to see some incision as well um, and eventually it gets to this classic proglacial braided system where essentially we've got a river that's so choked with sediment and it's trying to kind of even out its energy so it starts to braid and, and carve new channels for itself. And what we've done at this site, we've looked at two different rivers. I'll only focus on one of them today though. Um, and the little sampling sites are marked out by these little blobs. You'll notice one of them um, isn't filled in. Uh, that would have been a sampling site, but we saw some absolutely humongous polar bear footprints. And essentially we just ran off um, and just picked up the next sampling site. Um, quite terrifying. They, the footprints are almost as big as your face. So you don't want to have one of those um, kind of smacking around the head hence why we ran off. So we're one site down. Just to kind of zone in then on, on one of those rivers, I think this is from um, River One on the previous slide. So don't bother to kind of get to grips with these graphs uh, nitty gritty, I'll kind of talk you through the main ideas and, and what we're thinking about. So generally in this catchment, the elemental composition is dominated by oxygen and silicon, kind of kind of elementally quite boring from, from my perspective, I think, because they kind of really dominate the system here. But what we can also see is things like iron, potassium, 
sodium, calcium, titanium um, as well. So what we're thinking when we, when we want to look at downstream transformation, we don't really want to home in on, on these really bulky elements here, the ones that really dominate the signal. We want to look at some of those more nuanced ones. And this is based on a whole bunch of literature about the kind of uh, transformations that we would expect to see in some of these systems, things that have been seen elsewhere in places like the Alps and so on. Um, so here I've just, I've just picked out calcium. Um, typically this one does tend to get concentrated downstream in a, in a very cold meltwater river, calcium tends to become concentrated as we move downstream. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. So even over quite short distances, um, just a few kilometers downstream, um, from the ice margin here, we are starting to see that calcium does show this, this vague kind of concentration trend, or it increases in its relative abundance as we move downstream. Again, just pulling out a few of the um, things that we've looked at here. We don't plan to go over all of the elements, of course, and um, so I've picked out some of the more interesting ones. Iron, we can see a slight contrast here. So as we move downstream, so again, same scale here, we see that slight reduction in the amount of iron as we move downstream, quite a gentle transition. Magnesium, again, we see from the ice margin, we see a little bit of a dip, almost as though it's kind of being flushed out. And then we start to see that being concentrated a little bit more as we move downstream. One of the other measurements that we've done so far is total carbon. Um, so this uh, kind of covers an umbrella term for inorganic carbon, so things that will be found within the, the bedrock, um, but also uh, organic carbon as well, so things from biological um, productivity and things like that. Um, one of the things I need to do when I get back to the lab is to get the measurements of the, just the organic carbon. So another reason why I'm, I'm so keen to get back into my office and get all the data sets. So just to bear in mind that this covers all types of carbon at the moment and eventually we'll split this down into inorganic and organic. What we can start to do is then to address this idea of how are things changed downstream and within the stream, we can start to split this off into the different depositional settings. So we can see that as we move downstream, as one might expect, we're getting a little bit more carbon being stored on those banks. Essentially, they're perched slightly away from the current stream. So they're probably a little bit safer in terms of soil formation. So we can get some of that um, organic carbon, if that is indeed an organic carbon signal, um, perched onto those banks. The bars are slightly more complicated. Some of them become a little bit more depleted some of them become a little bit more increased and that might be a representation of this such a transitional environment that we see on some of these riverbeds as, as the river here is starting to figure out what it's doing some of those banks um, and those bars will become used and then abandoned and then reused again over time so quite a complicated signal but one where we can certainly start to, to pull out these downstream trends If we shift then, so we'll just leave North Greenland and we'll head over to Disco Island, probably one of my favourite names for a field site ever. Um, we're going to go here to, um, it's actually Lingmark's Brain is the name of the, the ice cap, and we're working on Chamberlain, just this outlet here. So I know I've been in touch with a few other people working on this particular site and in this particular river system, um, and it is a really, a really interesting one to, to analyse. So unlike what we're seeing in North Greenland, it's actually relatively steep. Um, so 450 metres, whereas in uh, Station Nord it was just over 100 metres or so. What we do see is where we see this quite steep drop off, and um, that's this quite steeply incised bedrock gorge in, in this part of the, the valley um, here, just around about two, two kilometres down from the ice margin. We have got um, samples all the way from kind of up here and heading down this main trunk valley here, but I'm going to just focus on this little um, outlet here just those three kilometers or so downstream just because it's a little bit more uh, readily comparable with what we see at station nord so again unlike what we're seeing in north greenland quite steep actually here there's lots of moraines uh, i remember when i first went to this ice margin i thought it was probably one of the ugliest glaciers i've ever seen and um, looks beautiful in winter when it's kind of got this lovely snow drape over everything it's quite magical but in the summer, it just looks like a big factory of gravel, basically. Lots of lots, lots and lots of, of gravel coming out, but also lots of really fine material kind of choking up the river system. And it comes out this very bright red. So it's just stuff coming off from the bedrock, basically. Um, 
In terms of comparisons with North Greenland, it seems like a much more mature river system. Um, and I'll show you some photos so you can kind of see what I mean by that. So here's the ice margin here. Um, very quickly, we get into this kind of channelized flow. We don't have that idea that the river's just freaking out at its margins and it's not quite in a channel just yet. And this is just um, a Google Earth image up in the top right here. So north here is facing down, um, just so you can orientate yourself there. Um, but we see this very obvious channelized flow. And you can even see on Google Earth how it's running this very rich red colour. It's got a lot of um, load within there, a lot of fine sediment in there. It's also incising into a lot of moraines. There are quite a few moraine belts and little remnants of moraines sat through this valley. Um, so the river has had to punch its way through those. We've also got some abandoned or ephemeral channels. So evidence that this river has really been sat there for a long time, moving around. We have some um, reaches where it's incised into bedrock as well. Um, so lots going on here. Quite a complicated picture in comparison to what we see at Villem, which is essentially like a, a kind of textbook dream river system. Eventually we get into this established braided thing here and then the river does a little turn and heads down Blazer Dalla. So just a really, really quick um, summary of what we see here. So slightly different um, elemental composition coming out of the bedrock, a little bit more exciting than what we see up at Station Nord. And again, I've picked out some of the key things here just for some comparison's sake, basically. So the ice margin here is at zero. So you can see that we were able to access some of the, the subglacial um, conduits as they come out of the, of the ice. I would kind of take these, um, these measurements here quite lightly. And we certainly didn't climb that far into the glacier. Um, in fact, we didn't even climb under them. So I think that's a GPS kind of freaking out with the the positioning there, but we were certainly able to get a sense of what was coming directly from the glacier. So we can see I've got titanium um, and I've got uh, calcium here, just like with the other one where we looked at calcium. We can see there isn't really much of a trend, it's just kind of bumbling along. We don't see any sense of concentration or depletion of certain elements as we move downstream. Part of the reason for this, as I've been thinking about this, as I've said, it's quite a complicated foreland. It's a relatively mature foreland. Um, and the river is constantly having to battle its way through these different moraine bands, which will then obviously introduce older sediment into the system that then gets reworked. The river then has to adjust to that. It's got to carry new material that may have been deposited in previous glacier still stands as those moraines were being built as the glaciers receded. So what's going on here? There's a lot of things complicating the system. Again, if we look at things like um, total carbon, um, again, ice margin, bed, bar, and bank, um, we can see it's quite a complicated signal. So just to kind of give a bit of a summary there, there's quite a lot of material there that I've talked about, some ideas, some little bits of data. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of where we're up to with this and, and what we want to do next. So basically in these, um, proglacial regions and proglacial environments more broadly worldwide, we are in this very important landscape evolution phase as the ice starts to exit the catchment and other processes start to take hold. And that leaves us open to a lot of variation in terms of downstream changes in these sediments and in these environments, often over quite short distances, so that the data I've presented today are often kind of three kilometres, five or six kilometres downstream. Uh, relatively short catchment in the scheme of things. We can also see that things will start to change over time as those river systems develop and they kind of entrench themselves into the channels and things start to become more confined and um, that leads to a lot of changes too. We can identify some in-stream variations and that's something I haven't had time to present here but we can start to pull apart those depositional settings and what's going on with those. We can see changes within the catchment but likely we can also see um, Greenland-wide changes as well, as we would expect, because it is such a hugely variable environment in terms of bedrock and in terms of glacial style too. So essentially, this is keying into this idea that we would need to look at this, this whole process-based approach from multiple different scales, 
And then we, once we can start to get a handle on what is going on with these highly transient fallings, how does that then influence other processes that are going on in those catchments? So in terms of what's next, finally get back to the lab, hopefully at some point. Um, we really want to interrogate that organic carbon content a little bit more. Um, and then we can start to pull out some of these more uh, detailed comparisons between these different depositional settings. So very much a work in progress still. So thanks very much for listening. Um, you're welcome to email me. Um, and we do have um, an interact blog as well from previous field seasons. Um, and you're welcome to go and have a look at that, see what we've got up to. Cool, and I'll, I'll happily take any questions if you've got them now too. Thank you so much, Catherine. Are there any questions for Catherine at this point? You can also submit your question in chat. So if Catherine is able to stay um, over the next presentation as well, you can also respond in the chat box. I would just uh, like to quickly ask, how did you handle the polar bear situation? Was there always uh, someone in the team that was monitoring for the polar bear so that when you get caught up in uh, <laughs> sampling, then you probably wouldn't notice if a polar bear is approaching? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we normally um, will take it in turns to, to sample and then someone else will be on watch. Um, we always have a satellite phone as well and radios and things. Um, so actually on that occasion we had um, we'd seen those polar bear prints and then we then rang the military base nearby at Station Nord and said, yeah, there are these bear prints. And they said, oh yeah, we've just seen a bear and it's headed this way. So yeah, it's, it's quite cool. But um, yeah, then when you have to then camp for the evening knowing that it's around, it's yeah. never, the kind of fear never really goes away, I think. <laughs> kind of strange. <laughs> Thank you so much once more, Catherine.